Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Biscuit Discussions. I'm your host, Abu Basson. This week's episode, I'm joined by Chakumacha Madivandila forward Tabu Myamane. You better believe I did that on my first take. We chat about how fate set him up on course to becoming a professional footballer, how he formed part of one of the shortest pre-contact deals in the history of the game, how adversity off the field inspired TTM to net bank up glory this season, while he also voices his confidence at a recall to the Bafana Bafana setup following Hugo Bruce's appointment. Nimane also hosts his own podcast and has a YouTube channel. Tabo, thanks for joining me on this key discussions. Uh, you're the first professional footballer to be on the show. I've had a few coaches and administrators uh, in, in football um, in the South African game. So it's great to have a professional footballer on the show for the very first time in episode 23, um, which is quite suitable because I think you do wear jersey number 23, if I'm not mistaken. So Yeah, that's um, correct. So I think that's great. Thanks for joining me. Um, yeah, if we can maybe just start uh, at the very start of your professional career. Um, I, th- I first heard of you when you were playing varsity cup football. And obviously we met when when you went to Tux uh, a few years later. Just, it's it's not a common route to follow, going the varsity route for professional footballers in South Africa. But how do you feel that really benefited your career um, going forward? Um, obviously, after metric, um, I had a choice of um, pursuing athletics or football and then I chose football because I had um, a scholarship from um, UJ and UP for athletics and then I had a scholarship at NW for soccer. So I I chose NW and I did my three years there and on my last year, Varsity Cup was introduced, like the soccer Varsity Cup was introduced, the football part of it. And um, it was obviously divine time because God knew the appointed time that on my last year, I'm gonna play Varsity Cup and I'm gonna sign a pre con um a professional contract. So it all worked out good. And I'm very glad that I managed to study and you know pursue football and then eventually managed to get um a pro contract. How important is it to have the the study background and the degree, you know, behind your name? Um, especially going into a career that, you know, it, it doesn't last very long. It's you know, for for most footballers, it's 10 years max. Um, I think you know, you you've really worked it out pretty well and, you know, setting yourself up very nicely for life after football. Yeah, I guess, obviously, if you look at it traditionally, um, everyone, wants to, everyone wants to be educated, wants to have uh, a certificate, a diploma or a degree, whatever you want. Um, that's the traditional way of looking at it. Um, but over the years, we have noticed that um, the traditional way is not the only way, you understand, because some people are not born to, you know, to sit in class and, you know, study for three years and get that degree and stuff. Some people are entrepreneurs and they just go about it, going to football and start a business and start other, um, invest in other ventures and then they manage to, you know, succeed. So I don't think um, there's only one route, you know, for professional uh, football, uh, football player to, for life after football, basically. I think there's a lot of avenues one can pursue either traditional education where you go to a class, you get your your diploma or degree and whatever, or you start a business or you become an entrepreneur or you, you know, you pursue stuff in football after football. So for me, I chose the traditional way and I'm glad it's, it worked out, but will I use the, (laughs) my qualification after football? I don't know yet. You said it was divine intervention with uh, Varsity Cup coming in, you know, your third year of studies. Um, how, how awesome was that for your career as a footballer playing Varsity Cup? Um, I remember going up to NW Mafi King for, I think, one or two games. And I remember the crowd being pretty vocal and being, you know, a really cool vibe. And I think we got that at all Varsity Cup games. Um, how did that set you up for what was to come in your professional career? Yeah, obviously when we playing in our second year we were playing like the Vodacom League. What is it ABC now? Yeah, it's called ABC now. And we didn't have, you know, TV coverage. We didn't have a lot of supporters coming to the stadium. So when um Varsity football started, everything changed. Now you you're being televised, your game are being televised. Um the crowd is there, um, the media is there, you understand. So yeah. as a um, as an amateur player, you start um, preparing your mind for pro football because it's kind of like that if you go into into the PSL or NFT or whatever. 
that, you know, you, your games are going to be televised. How are you going to handle that after a good game or a bad game when you walk around the streets and people recognize you? How are you going to um, hold yourself, you know? And how are you going to um, interact with people as well? Because you mustn't let it go to your head. So I think Vastika prepared me well for my next step. Because when I got into PSL, it wasn't like a shock. It wasn't like a culture shock. I was already used to, you know, being on TV, people recognizing me a bit and, you know, the fans then they, so it was, it was a good step. Basica was a good step for me, to be honest. Yeah. And the premiership, you made your, you know, your debut, of course, with Amatux. Um, you played there for a few seasons. How's it playing for Amatux? You know, obviously a vasty setup as well, um, but had a few really good players, um, you know, coming through the ranks there. What was it like spending some years there before move, moving on to Supersport? It was very special because obviously it's my first um, PSL, my first professional team. So, pardon. So it was very special for me and um, I really enjoyed myself. The, the, the setup is very professional. The, the staff, the students, everyone is like, for sports so you always tuned in because it's like a sports sports university so i really enjoyed myself there and i had a couple of good seasons and you know um i hold i'm attacks close to my heart you moved on to super sports united um obviously you started really well there um i know injury crept in a bit towards the end of your time with super sport but what do you take from from your time with them and what's your fondest memory would you say um, I, how, how many years was it? There? I think four. Mm. Yeah, so I had yeah, four years at Super Sport. Um, longest, the yeah, longest team I've ever played for. So I had it was like it was like home to me, you understand? Yeah. Because obviously, once you go beyond two years at the team, it starts feeling like home and it's also special. Um so I enjoyed myself a lot. Um I got a lot of support. Um, and obviously when, um, injuries creeped in, like, uh, some niggles, I was, I still got support and they still took care of me. It was just unfortunate that, um, at the time my contract was ending and, um, you know, in football, sometimes things don't work out and TJ have to move on, but I really had, um, a good time at super sport. I think we played six cup finals when I was there. We won, I think, three or four, if I'm not three, I think, my time there. So, obviously, man, they gave me my first trophy yeah. as a professional football player. So, Super Sport is very special to me as well. What? How do you deal with injuries as a player? I mean, players deal with injuries, dif- you know, in different ways, and, and rightfully so. Um, you know, how do you deal with it? Obviously, there's the initial disappointment and frustration and then you you really need to try and build yourself up to to get back to full fitness um how difficult is it for for people who don't know uh what it's like to 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 receive that type, type of setback obviously it's like psychologically challenging um getting injured because no one wants to get injured but you cannot um you know dwell too much on the injury you need to focus and try to find a solution Obviously, first, first you need to identify the problem, like why you're getting injured, and then come up with a solution. So for me, it's over the years I realized that every player gets injured. Um, you know, even the best players get injured. So I'm not immune to injuries. So for me, it was that thing of um, when I get an injury, it's not it's not such a big deal. Yes, the, it's disappointing at the time, but. I'll get over it because it's not career ending. You understand? As long as it's not career ending, you get over it and you come back and you play your heart out. You make sure that you do your extras, you eat the gym and get your body in shape. Keep your body in shape, actually. The most important thing is to keep your body in shape. You then signed a a pre-contract with with these vets. Um, Obviously, we all know what happened with vets, you know, after 99 years. Um, And then, you know, News broke, obviously, that they had sold their status. Uh, we spoke a bit about this off air just before the the interview or the podcast, rather. Um, you know, how difficult was it then when they sold their status to to switch your mindset back to okay, I'm without a club now, um, and then funny enough, finding yourself at, at TTM like a month later. 
Yeah, obviously, after signing the pre contract, um, it didn't actually last long. <laughs> <laughs> Shortest pre contract in history. <laughs> yeah, it was like signing a pre contract, then news broke out, and then it was like, oh, take back my signature. <laughs> and uh, I think a month later, I found myself um, at DTM again. So I guess it was, it was meant to be, I guess. But yeah, man, obviously when I said um, to Vert that um, I think I'm walking away from the pre-contract and they understood, they handled it very professionally as well. They understood. And I wasn't really, um, I, was, I wasn't really scared of not having a team at the time because um, I knew that eventually something will come up because, well, um, I serve a living God that, always provides you understand so for me the most important thing was to keep on training prepare my mind well for the next team and funny enough it didn't also take long for for ttm to reach out and and we're here now we net bank cup champions yeah so i guess it was meant to be yeah it worked out pretty well like you alluded to um net bank cup champions winning one all over chippa in at free state stadium how was it building up to that game? I think, you know, a lot of people obviously wrote the team off, especially the way you started the season. Um, do you think, you know, as a, as a bunch of players, did you guys come together and say, look, you know, let's prove people wrong. Um, you know, it's no mean feat. I think you guys beat five top flight teams to get to the title, which is, you know, incredible achievement. Um, and then winning it, uh, you know, in Free State Stadium kept off, you know, a great run for yourself. Yeah, obviously we we have a solid team. Um, we have a, a good team. Like I, I back my team up. We have a good team, and yeah, a lot of people wrote, wrote us for off because of um, media and you know the news that I, that were breaking out. Those every maybe every single week we had a story coming out of TTM. Yeah. So obviously that creates a, a negative vibe. The public view um, views us differently, but. Us as a team, as a collective, as players, we knew that we can do, we can win things. Um, and that was an opportunity to, for us to prove to people that we have a good team and can win things if we put our minds our minds into something, you understand? So, yeah, it was, it's not nice, obviously, reading about your team every single week in the papers, but I guess it's part of football. There's no bad publicity. Yeah, true. <laughs> how, how difficult can it be for a player though? You know, when you, I mean, you just, you just human at the end of the day, uh, you go into social media, you read, you know, you scroll through the timeline, you read things. Um, how difficult is it to keep your focus on, on the field of play and obviously just focusing on what's important in the end of the day? Um, to be honest, if you can ask anyone at GTM, um, I think we mute, we immune to it now, so it's <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it's part of our. I think it's part of our contract. When you read something bad about TTM, you just brush it off. <laughs> so, I mean, are there any players in the team that uh, you know really stood out for you during the run to the NetBank Cup um, victory? Obviously, a guy like I think Alfred Ngane uh, was really important. Um, you know, really experienced campaigner and. Pretty good penalty taker as well, if I must say so. Yeah. <laughs> I was quite surprised by that. Yeah. Um, obviously, I mean, you're pretty good at the free kicks. Um, is there any other players that that really put their hands up in your point of view that you thought, okay, yeah, these guys played a big part in us winning? I, to be honest, I think it was it's a, it was a collective effort. If you look, if you track back, and you look at the games, um, we we played as a, as a unit. So if one if one player was not there for that match, the other one stepped up and fight, you know. So for me to single out maybe individuals, it will be unfair. I think everyone stepped up during the NetBank Cup. And I think that's why we managed to win because we we played so well together and whoever played at the at the time um did very well. Obviously, before Dylan Kerr came in, you, um, Paul Maleka and DVD Matabula, they were both there already, um, you know, two assistants that have played the game. And I remember Matabula, especially in his time at Supersport United, he was real quality. 
um, you know, how, how much of an influence did they have on, on your run to the, the title and how, how great is it to work with former footballers, you know, in a coaching capacity? Um, obviously, it's, it's easier, you know. It's easier if someone has played the game before and they understand the dynamics of the game, they understand the players, they understand if you say you're tired, you're not, you're not faking. You understand if you, if you're angry, they understand because they've been there. So it helps the team. It helps the players to be more free, to be more open, and to converse with you know either Coach Mpo or Coach David because they understand because they've been there. They've been where we are now. So I think it's um, it was a good move from the team to get you know both of them in. Because um, now players can talk to them and, you know, suck information from them and, oh, yeah, suck information from them and, you know, and um, learn from them because they've been, they've played before and they can advise where needed. Maybe just a quick word on Dylan Coe. I've had him on the podcast before. Um, he's quite a character. Uh, obviously, also played in the South Africa in South Africa in the eighties. Um, had some success over here. Uh, what is he like in the changing room? For those who don't know him, sorry, Tabo. I think I lost you there for five for a few. Seconds. Uh, what is he like in the in the changing room? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Oh, he's a character, man. Oh, he's a funny guy. Um, <laughs> out of all the coaches that I've worked with, I think, yeah, he's yeah, he's a funny old man. I can't, I won't lie to you, but he's he's a good he's a good guy, um, um, a good coach. Um, loves football, very passionate about football. Um, we had all his cracks are now and then, um, and it's easy to talk to him, to be honest, because. Um, he's a light, he's a light coach that he's open and you can talk to him about anything. Does he have the TTM badge tattooed on his leg yet or, or not yet? <laughs> I think he's getting it at the end of the season. <laughs> what about a Tabu Mnyamane tattoo there on his leg as well? <laughs> <laughs> that will be very weird and awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tabu, but uh, one thing you've always been good at uh, is free kicks and I think you know a lot of times we we don't understand the you know the process that goes into set piece taking is it something that you've you've practiced a lot uh you know as a, as a youngster um obviously we all imagine uh when we're younger that we we Ronaldinho or David Beckham <laughs> standing over the ball who did you imagine you were when you were younger and you know is it something you practiced a lot Oh man, to be honest, um, uh, I won't lie to you. For me, the I think the best free kick taker for me will be David Beckham. Mm -hmm. And obviously, growing up, you check how he takes it. Um, there's a lot of specialists. Ronaldo hits the knuckleball, but David always has a bend, a curl. So for me, it was always a thing of my free kick must always have a curl because I don't have Cristiano's power. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I I think, yeah, Beckham's um, way of taking them plays a huge role on how I take them. But I'm not saying I'm Beckham, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, but I just, um, I just learned from him and it works. I guess it works, to be honest, yeah, it works. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, some, sometimes I surprise myself, to be honest, but yeah, can't complain. Yeah, just two more questions on the football side of things. Um, obviously, TTM are still not safe on the you know the DSTV Premiership standings. What do you guys need to do in the final few games to to make sure you don't go into that playoff spot, uh, that fifteenth place? Um, you know, it's looking pretty bleak for Black Leopards at this point in time. But it seems like position fifteen to twelve is very very tight. What do you guys need to do in the final few games just to make sure you rise, you know, above those relegation places? I think it's it's uh, pretty simple. We need to win the last four games if we want to be safe. We can't. I don't want to do the maths and say we win this, we draw. No, we just need to win four games and close off the season. Because if we win four games, we save. So it's simple as that. 
And then, you know, uh, I think a lot of people forget that you, you've you got a few Bafana Bafana caps. I remember you making your debut against Swaziland, I think it was. Um, and you, you scored in that game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Do you, do you harbor any hopes of, of getting back into the national team? Obviously, a few good good games in a row won't do you any harm. Is it something that's in your mind or do you just focus on, on your club at the moment? No, I'll be back in the national setup very soon. Um, I believe that um, with the new coach coming in, it's a clean slate for everyone. Yeah. So I think um, a few good performances and, you know, a good word from someone, <laughs> then yeah, <laughs> I'll be back in the national team very soon. Yeah, I'll give him a call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that confidence. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good way, a good note to to end the football side of things. I just quickly want to touch on on your podcast and your YouTube channel. Just tell us a bit more about your your podcast. Um, it's great to to see footballers involved, you know, on on that side of the game. I think it's called the the Victory Corner podcast, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. For those who yeah, haven't had the, had the privilege to listen to it, just tell us a bit more about what it does, uh, what you guys chat about on a weekly basis. So the Victory Corner podcast is um, it's about more than football. So you know, as soccer players, we always um, classified under one category, which is your football, and that's it. So for me and my best friend, when we started the Victory Corner, it was for us to show people that um, an athlete can be more than an athlete. Um, he can be a podcaster, he can be a YouTuber, he can be an influencer, you understand? So hence, my, hence the podcast doesn't only focus on footballers as well. We've brought in musicians, we've brought in, um, I think, a lawyer, we've brought in social media influencers, and we've brought in a youth pastor as well. So it's it's diverse. It's to show that at the end of the day, before of, before one is a footballer, mm. um, one is a person, and I can be involved in anything that I put my mind into. And it's a good platform where it's not for celebrities also. It's for everyone, you understand? Yeah. So it's a good platform where if one is to, how can I say, um, if one is to, um, shout out their name or if one is to promote their own brand um, we give them the platform to talk to us and we just have a good conversation and that's it and the U- the YouTube channel it's me and my wife um, the Myamanis on YouTube um, and just we just have fun there we create um, you know good content um, the point of the YouTube channel to be honest it's for our son so that when he grows up he can see that um, mommy and daddy were having fun, you know, and were creating memories. And obviously, once you put it on the net, it won't go away. Yeah. So no. it's for, yeah, yeah, it's for our son. And just to show him that if you want to do anything in life, you can, you can do it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's very cool, and it's awesome to see footballers in that space, and you guys doing that type of thing. If you weren't a footballer, what would be you be involved with today? Um, do you think, um, is, do you have any hidden talents that we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've been trying to find my hidden talents, but to be honest, um, I think I'll be probably working at a corporate firm somewhere, um, doing, I don't know, I don't know, but, um, to be honest, I was going to probably go to school, study and work. Mm. Um, I, I, I love social media. I love, um, I love the space where you create content, um, you know, podcasting, um, presenting. I also love that entertainment space. So maybe I'll look into that as well. Will we see you on Supersport and after your career is finished? Um, you can put in a good word for me at uh, Soccer <laughs> Dream and, <laughs> and Supersport. <laughs> yeah, and I did. But yeah. So, yeah. uh, I mean, you say you love social media and the marketing side of things and, and you know, content creation. Uh, I think uh, as, you know, South African footballers go, you're really right up there in terms of, you know, seeing that side of the game and how important it is and, and engaging with your sponsors like Lotto, for example, like you're wearing right yeah. now. How important <laughs> is it to, to you know, get that engagement and get that relationships um, as a footballer to make sure that, you know, after, you know, your your career is done that you've, 
forged a lot of relationships and it makes that i think it makes that step into the you know corporate world a lot easier yeah i think um for me personally i think that um if you view yourself as more than a footballer then you want to start um, tapping into other things so obviously when you started instagram facebook whatever everyone was just posting and having fun but there's there's a business side to it you understand and at the end of the day it's also a stream of income whether we like it or not. So if you look at that as well as a footballer to create another source of income, whether it's like 10 rand, one rand, a thousand rand, it's it's better than nothing. Mm. You understand? So that's how I looked at it. And I thought to myself, well, let me take my social media seriously and try to monetize it and make sure that I get something out of it, whether it's a sponsorship, an endorsement deal, a, promo- a promotion or whatever you call it. At the end of the day, I'm bringing something in that's um, that's new and that's different from football. And I think it's working out because um, I managed to secure a few endorsements over the years. Once I turned, once I monetized my Instagram, actually, I started like, you know, working with um, different brands and it really helped because at the end of the day, when you walk into an office and you're like, I have this amount of followers and I have this amount of engagement, they see that this person takes um, the social media side um, serious. Yeah, taking your brand serious. That's that's very important. Yeah. Otabo, I think that's a great way to end the podcast. Thanks for joining me uh, and good luck in the, the rest of the league games this season. And yeah, your insight was was really great and, and hearing from you again. And yeah, stay in touch and, and keep well. Um, no, thank you for having me, man. It was, um, it was a good chat. Um, I hope we can do it again soon in person. And I also, I'm going to invite you also on my podcast um, very soon so that you can chop it up real nice. Yeah, looking forward to it. Cheers, Dabo. Right. Cheers, bud. Thank you for listening to Disky Discussions. If you have any questions or guests you'd like me to have on the show, please hit me up at AB underscore Basson on Twitter or on Instagram. Stay safe, like, subscribe, aware.